But what makes the stanchions especially scary places is that you have to open the brass fasteners there and reattach them to the hand ropes just beyond the stanchions. One at a time, Cottrell cautioned. Still, every time I unhooked, I would for some seconds be attached to the guide tables by only one rope. I wonder what it would be like to dangle below the barrel cable by one rope, whether it would support my weight, and if so, how anyone could pull me back onto the cable. As an extra precaution, I was tethered to, patrol, to, to patrolman ledges immediately in front of me. At first I found this comforting, but then I began to think, what if Ledges, who was much bigger than me, slipped and slid backwards, knocking my feet out from under me? The barrel cables rise at a precipitous angle, reaching 44 degrees as you approach the top. You have the sensation of climbing straight up into the sky, like Jack in Jack and the Beanstalk, with a tower ahead representing the giant. Because of the extreme angle, Ledges, who preceded me by only a few feet, was always substantially higher, increasing my sense of his size and what the impact might be if he slipped. I didn't like being tethered to him at all. I kept wondering why Fridella, who was the youngest of the group and our point man, had the nickname The Devil. Why is he called that, I grunted to Cottrell over my shoulder. Just what we call him, he replied which didn't re reassure me at all. I hoped the devil wasn't the kind of guy who took unnecessary risks. Things were already pretty risky up here for me. As I climbed, I began to have a new fear. What if I got a cramp in a calf muscle? How could I possibly get rid of it up here? And the climbing was all in the calves. I knew that because mine were turning into rocks inside my jeans. From time to time, Cottrell would ask, you all right? Sure, I'd tell him. I wasn't going to say otherwise. I knew that if I ever talked about how scared I was, it would only make me more scared. I just kept my eyes glued in front of me on Legis's boots. I didn't want to look up to where the tower beckoned, except to occasionally ascertain that it was getting closer. And I certainly didn't want to look down. I just went the whole way up, just looking at this guy's boots, step by step. And I certainly didn't want to look down. The climb, one step at a time, was a metaphor for a lot of things, for building a house board by board, for writing a book word by word, plus terror, of course. I thought of Zen. I thought of be here now. I told myself that the climb was a kind of meditation. I just had to stay in my zone. I just had to be here now. Slowly, we advanced towards the top. The wind was blowing a gale up there, and I worried about being literally blown off the barrel cable. Also, though this hadn't been a particularly cold day down below, up here the wind chill was fierce. I hadn't dressed appropriately for the occasion. I thought about hypothermia. I thought about the man found high up in one of the towers some years ago, frozen to death like one of those bodies occasionally found up in the Himalayas. Some believe he was intent on suicide, changed his mind, couldn't get down, and died of the cold. Now we were approaching the top, and the angle of the barrel cable was so steep, my head was leaning back, my feet well forward of my head. Patrolman Fidella moved forward, and climbing onto a little steel platform attached to the tower, worked the handle of the door leading into the saddle room. Now, what the saddle room is, is up on top of the tower, there are these huge steel things that weigh 180 tons each. And the cables, the, uh, the saddle room's in the south part of it, saddle room's in the north part of it, we were in the north part. And I had always thought the cables moved, but no, they, they are bolted to the saddles. And it's not the cables that move, it's the tower that's flexible. It's hard to believe, but there it is. And that's what the saddle room is for. The cables come through. They've come up to there, and now they start down. And they come almost, almost down to the bridge level. They're only 15 feet high uh, uh, at one point. And then they start up to the other tower again. So just, just so you think about next time you uh, drive uh, across. Fridella kept trying to open the door. It didn't budge. 
He tried it again. I couldn't believe it. It was locked from the inside. I had made it to 15 feet from the top, and now I was stuck. Lieutenant Minnelli got out onto his radio, and over the squawking coming from the other end, I heard him say, you got to be kidding. And then he shouted to me over the wind, you, don't worry, Michael. They're coming. They'll be up here in 15 minutes. <laughs> so I got to stand there in the wind for 15 minutes. Did I really have to stand there for an extra 15 minutes with the wind howling and just wait? I stole tiny looks below. The first time I had looked down during the whole 40 minutes of climbing the barrel, everything was tiny except for the giant tower in front of me. And then there was a loud sound, and it was coming closer. A blue helicopter with Port Authority written on its side circled us, and I could see the pilot clearly. Did he intend to strafe us? What's he doing, I asked Cottrell. Probably checking on us, I, he said. Why, I asked. Cottrell shrugged, I learned later. These guys had never informed anybody that we were going up there. And anybody goes up there, if, if nobody's informed, they just think there's terrorists up there. And so this guy was right around the tower like this. I could see him, I, God, it was terrifying how the, the noise and, and the helicopter adding to everything else. This seemed a good time for a photo. Taking pictures would take my mind off our ridiculous position on the barrel cable. I wanted a picture to prove to my family that I'd been up there. Heck, I wanted a picture to prove to myself that I'd been up there. I handed Legis a disposable camera that I was carrying in my jacket pocket, and untethering from me, he climbed up onto the platform next to Fridella. The two of them took turns snapping pictures with Cottrell and Manelli behind me, and behind them, the bridge deck far below in all of Manhattan behind it, as you've seen in those photos coming around. What seems like ages later, there was a scraping sound inside the saddle room. In other words, a cop had to drive out from Fort Lee, turn around the way we did, pull up at the tower, not the cables, and take the elevator up in order to open the door from the inside. Relieved, I followed a I followed Fidella and Legis inside, and Cottrell and Minnelli uh, followed me. I was suffused to New Jersey from New York and camp out in Fort Lee. Then it was only the bridge. Now it was also my bridge. I had taken possession of it. I was ready to write this book. That's how the book actually ends.